Building a gaming PC is actually pretty darn easy, as a lot of you know. There's only a couple of screws and then maybe seven components. There used to be eight core components, but with the obsolescence of optical drives, we've dropped down and consolidated to about seven on average. So this video it talks about how to build a gaming PC, and we're going to go over the basics of assembly, cable management, and initial setup. And before we get to that, some quick notes here. PC building is very modular, but there are, of course, some compatibility issues. So you need to make sure that your socket type is compatible with the CPU. You need to make sure that the memory is compatible with the CPU and the motherboard. You can check all these lists online. And check the article linked in the description below for a lot more information on compatibility checking, how you can learn to do it yourself rather than use a tool to do it, and what you need to know with part selection. For our build, we have sort of a modular PC build here, and that is to demonstrate just how much these components can change between different use cases for different users. So in our setup, we have two video card options, two CPU options, and a couple of different memory options. The core setup here uses an MSI GTX 970 or GTX 980, depending on what we want to do, really. And this is sort of a production rig for us. We're going to use it internally. You can see it already assembled here. And this will be used for video production, things like that. So we're using the GTX 980, but if you wanted to lower your cost, you could drop in something like the MSI 970 Gaming 4G card here. It's a four gigabyte card. And then for the motherboard, we've got an MSI Z170A SLI board, and that's for, you can do SLI, of course, but we're not doing that here. We're just doing one card. For the rest of it, the CPU cooler that, of course, goes atop the 6700K. 6700K no longer includes a CPU cooler. So we're using this. This is an Enermax ETS T40 Fit. This is an aftermarket cooler that'll give us some overclocking headroom on our 6700K. Alternatively, you could select something like an i5 6400 or 6500, which is one of our parts, and that would give you the option of non-overclocking and reducing your price. You could even go down to a non-Z chipset because the Z chipset on the, the motherboard down here is actually for overclocking and things of that nature, some higher end functions in the BIOS. Power supply, of course, powers it all, and we're using an Enermax DigiFanless power supply for that. This, this is actually just a lower wattage PSU, and you can see in our guide, you normally don't need that much wattage, especially for a 970 build. And that has no fan, so it's going to be quieter, and then it's got braided cables, which is a nice add as well. SSD, we're using an OCZ drive, ARC 100 drive, that I picked up for this build, and then we'll throw in some kind of one terabyte storage for archival purposes. And then the memory, we're running Corsair's Vengeance LPX memory, which is 3200 megahertz. You can definitely drop the frequency on this. This is a DDR4 kit because Skylake requires DDR4 for this particular motherboard. Now, Skylake can do DDR3L, and some boards will do DDR3. It's definitely a bit of a push but we're using DDR4 memory for this because that's what the motherboard's built for. And then the speed is good for production tasks, video processing, things like that. And you can read and view our content on dual channel configurations in the past if you want to see how it affects the type of tasks you do. Gaming, not a huge impact, but we're running a 32 gigabyte kit. Alternatively, you could run a 16 gigabyte kit and that would be sort of the cheaper option, of course. And then to put everything in, we're using an NZXT H440 V2 case. That's this black case over here with some of the sound damping foam and things like that. So that is our mid-tower case for this build. Tools for a PC build are extremely limited and easy and accessible. You probably have them already, or at least one of them, and that is a Phillips screwdriver. And then we have this ESD wrist strap. So it's an anti-static wrist strap that grounds you if you use it properly. And a lot of people don't use it correctly. So view our previous content on anti-static materials and setup, and you'll see how to build one of these cables and use it correctly. So the way we do it is we cut the head off of a normal power supply cable that we're not gonna use. We bend the hot pins that go into the wall. So we bend those so they don't go into the wall because if they go into the wall and you do this incorrectly, it's not good. Please follow our previous guide on that, but you do that, cut the cable, and then just give direct access to the copper for the sort of alligator clip on the anti-static wrist strap. You want to make sure it's connected to the ground wire and that you've covered up safely any of the hot wires in there 
again, previous video for that. But that's what we're gonna use to make sure we're grounded during the build process and make sure nothing gets shocked. If you feel a shock come from your finger to a component like you would with a car door, there's a very good chance you've damaged something even at a sort of low level or a latent ESD event, something like that. So be careful building. Those are really the only things you need to know with assembly before getting started. The rest of it is just screwing in a couple Phillips screws and then you're pretty much done and connecting the cables, of course. So uh, let's get started. We're first gonna build this out of the case. The reason we do that is to make sure everything works and because it's a lot easier to get the CPU cooler in there before installing the motherboard into the case. So we'll do the CPU, the RAM installation, the CPU cooler installation. We'll test everything with the power supply. And then once we know it's all good and functional, we'll put it in the case and call it a day. Okay, so first we're gonna install the system as much as possible outside of the case. And the reason for that is because if something goes wrong, you want to know about it before you do all the work of installing it in the case and doing all the cabling. So just trust me on that. To get the CPU in there, you remove the CPU socket cover on the motherboard, which I've just done. And you want to keep that cover for warranty reasons. The Intel CPUs have two notches on either side, and you can line those notches up with the little nubs that stick up on the CPU socket itself. And there's also an arrow pointing to the bottom left corner in this case, but you can, of course, correlate that with your socket. AMD has pins in the CPU rather than in the socket, and that you can align by looking at their missing pins where they have transistors and things like that, and align those. And then for the AMD CPUs, they also have an arrow in the corner. So we've got the CPU installed. We'll do the cooler in a minute. First, let's do the memory installation. So for memory, you can run either four sticks or two sticks, ideally for the dual channel setup in this particular platform. And that is, a, uh, that is dependent on the CPU architecture. So this is a dual channel build we're assembling. You can see here, if you install it this way, that is the only way it will not fit. So the rule with RAM is if you apply pressure and it doesn't go, stop. And so you line this little notch here up with this one, rotate it accordingly, you install it, and pop these little pins out here. And then once you push down, you apply some force and you'll hear it snap. So that means that we've installed it correctly. It is seated all the way, very important to be seated all the way. And in this case, we're installing all four sticks. So we'll use all four slots. But if you're only doing two sticks, then you need to look at the manual and figure out which two slots you use to get the maximum memory capacity. Dual channels, not really that critical for gaming. We've done testing on it. You can actually look it up on the channel, but uh, we're gonna run it because we're doing a build that is very heavily targeted for production use internally at the site. That means we want the fastest memory we can get. And that's why we're running this Vengeance LPX setup at 3200 megahertz with the proper dual channel configuration so that we can render out videos as quickly as possible. So that's how you install the memory and the CPU. Now we'll do the CPU cooler. So now we're gonna install the CPU cooler. This part is one of the more tedious of building systems. It's actually normally the most difficult depending on what board you have. So we're using a Z-series board and unless you're running an Extreme Series Intel motherboard, it does take a bit more work to install one of these CPU coolers, but it's not that bad. First of all, you've got a back plate that goes on the back side of the motherboard. If you're running AMD, you'll have to remove it unless you're running an aftermarket cooler that uses the stock back plate. And then there's these different retentioners that are used and will depend on the cooler that you purchase. So this is not the exact same you'll see for every CPU cooler out there. Certainly not the same for liquid coolers. And we do have an alternative Enermax Slickmax cooler if we wanted to run a liquid cooler for this setup. So for this process, you basically first need to put on the thermal paste if it's not pre-applied as is done on liquid coolers these days. And when you're putting on the thermal paste, we have a few videos on this generally about the size uh, anywhere from a grain of rice to a pea, depending on how large the CPU itself is. And we like to apply it in the center and then torque down the CPU cooler to spec, and that will spread out the thermal paste appropriately across the surface. The point of the thermal paste is just to fill microscopic imperfections in the surface, and it's really not supposed to fill the whole plate, the whole cold plate, because that is actually worse than copper contact if copper contact can be made direct to CPU. Mount that on top of the CPU by following the instructions and then you want to tighten the corners across from each other. Not Don't tighten one side or one 
screw all at once. You definitely want to do opposing corners for tightening to distribute the weight evenly. So that's how you install the CPU cooler. Make sure it's all good and tight, not going to fall out. And then once you're done with that, plug in the four pin CPU fan header to the specific CPU fan plug on the motherboard. Don't plug it into a chassis fan port. And if you're running a liquid cooler, there's normally a pump power as well. Plug that in as your manual instructs you. All right, so take a good look at this. This board is flexing a lot right now. Not good for the board, not good for anything on it. This will happen if you over tighten those screws. So always go with monkey tight, not gorilla tight on these. You basically just want to be sort of hand tight, tight enough to hold it down and apply pressure, but not tight enough to do this with the board. So that's what we want to avoid. That is why you do not ever over tighten screws on a CPU cooler because it can do damage to the system in the long term or even the immediate future. Oh, there it goes. Found the point of tension. Okay, so to finalize our build outside of the case before assembling everything, we're gonna plug in the video card. You'll wanna hang this over the edge of your table. I'm not doing it here for demonstration purposes, but you'll plug in the video card in the top PCIe slot, hang that back silver plate over the edge of the table and then get your power supply ready. You need the 24 pin, which 24 pin goes in right here. And then you need the CPU EPS 12 volt header, which goes in over here near the CPU cooler. So that's your eight pin in this case. Sometimes they're four pin. So you plug those two cables in from the power supply, mount your video card, and then connect your appropriate PCIe cables. As you can see, we've got two banks right here. So you connect those, run the power to the wall, to the power supply, flip the on switch on the power supply, and then you can hit, if there is one present, hit a power button. It would normally be up here on the motherboard, and that'll turn the board on. If there's not one present, we have a video on jumping a motherboard electrically to jump a start signal to it. It's pretty easy. And as you can see here, you would basically take your screwdriver, locate the front panel headers, you got two banks here, and then find the one that is the power switch, that's normally PWR underscore SW, and you would jump the two pins that are appropriate to that switch to get it to turn on. All right, so now you install the board into the case if you want the IO shield, which I do not. If you want the IO shield, you put that in there before you put the motherboard in, of course, and you need these standoffs in here before you install the board, those standoffs are the black things that are sticking up. Sometimes they are a sort of brass color. And those are used to prevent a direct short. So they go in there to basically screw in the screws into, which I'm doing right now. There are eight of them. And you want the standoffs rather than straight into the case, which would potentially drag the board into the, uh, into the steel plate on the case. And that would cause a direct short which would mean your system would not boot. So you do all eight of these screws, do not skimp on these. And once you've got those in, we'll do the power supply, the power supply cables, and the video card last for ease, along with the storage devices. So now we're gonna install the power supply for NZXT's H440, S340, and for Corsair's new 600C. They do this thing where the power supply is actually in a separate compartment, and that is because they use a power supply shroud which is what's in here. And that hides all the cabling, makes things a lot cleaner to install. So those things have these brackets. This is not standard. You will not find this in every case. It has become somewhat of a standard this year, but it is not really uh, in everything just yet. So you won't have those everywhere, but we're gonna take the power supply, obviously on the side that connects the cables to be inside the case. And then we wanna expose the side with the power plug to the rear of the, the case here. And we want the fan pointed down in this instance because that's the only way for it to breathe. So we're gonna line this up with the four holes that are present for the power supply and screw it in and then we'll be good to go. So now we're gonna install the video card. All you need to do here is look for the appropriate slot. You normally want the top one and remove the cases sort of panel protectors in the back when you're ready to install this all it does is sock it in it's so it's just like ram where you get this sort of pop which is what we just felt there and if you want to remove it you push down a peg in the back that's over here 
and then you can just pull it out like that. It should never require any force to install or remove. If it does, something's wrong, stop and look at it and figure it out. So we're going to socket this in by lining up the rear I.O. shield and then slot that and then it's just a matter of installing a couple of screws into the uh, expansion base for the case. So we've got two screws for that. Use both screws because it will help prevent video card sag. If I only use one here, you'll see that it's actually sort of sagging a bit and that's not really good for anything. So installing two screws will help stop that from happening. And I would recommend just sort of saving the cabling for last and uh, install this video card first, do the cables later, and maybe check to make sure there's not any SATA or USB 3 cabling under the video card that you should install first. So that's how you do the video card. The SSD we've got installed down here already. And for this particular case, it's a little bit different than most cases because the SSD goes on top of the PSU shroud. It's literally just two or four screws depending on what kind of case you're using. You install it, you mount it into a bracket, and then later on you connect the cables. So that's all there is to the SSD installation, nothing special there. Now we're going to do the cabling, and this is the hardest part of the entire process, which is saying a lot because it's really not that hard otherwise. So first off, two main cables for the motherboard. There's the 24 pin power and the eight or four pin power for the CPU. And the 24 pins located to the right of the RAM. All you do is line up the clip with the clip on the socket, plug it in, do not force it. If you force it and it goes in the wrong way, you will cause damage to something. And then you plug in the eight pin just the same way up near the CPU. So those are the two main ones. A lot of people overlook that CPU header. And if you do, your system won't turn on. Normally won't be damaged, but it won't turn on. So next, after we've got those two power headers in the board, there's a couple other power cables to plug into the board for various things like fans. And those fan headers are the three or four pin ones. They used to be white, now they're white or black. And three pin means it is not PWM or pulse width modulated. And four pin means that it is, which means that the fan speed can be controlled by the motherboard directly. You want that. So take the CPU header, Plug the CPU header in directly to the motherboard in the CPU slot if you didn't already do that in our previous step where we built the board outside the case and assembled the CPU cooler. Next, if it's a liquid cooler, you plug in the three pin power from the CLC to an appropriate header. And then if you got case fans, you plug in those case fans to other three pin headers or four pin headers across the board. Now some cases like our NZXT H440 have fan hubs in the back. And so instead of plugging your fans into the board, you want to plug those into the fan hub. So you plug it into the rear of the case. It's a lot cleaner, has some control options, a lot of over voltage protection, things like that. Plug it in there. And then you plug that fan hub into the power supply directly, normally via four pin Molex or SATA power connector. In this case, it's four pin Molex. So those all connected. The next thing to look at is the front panel headers. And front panel headers are exactly what they sound like. They are cables or wires with headers on them and they come from the front of the case, normally for USB 2, USB 3, and power switch and LED items on the front of the case. So the power switch plugs in with other front panel control headers in the normally bottom right of the board. You want to look for something like FP1 or JFP2, and then you check the legend on the board. If there's not one present, check your manual. It is not standard. It's different for every board for the most part. And you plug in corresponding cables. So uh, the thing to look out for here, if it is a positive and negative cable set and it cares which way they're plugged in, you basically just want the text pointing outward. So if it's in the top row of front panel headers, you plug it in with the text facing up. If it's in the bottom row, you plug it in with the text facing down. And you plug in the power switch, the reset switch, HED LED, and power LED if you want those things. If you don't want the lights, don't plug them in. The next thing, also down in this area, is the USB 2 headers for USB 2 in the front of the case, if you have that. In that instance, you just look for the USB 2 headers. It's a cluster of about eight or so pins and there's one missing line it up plug it in you're done with that try and manage these cables by routing them appropriately through the behind area of the case before connecting them that way you can keep it all really clean and just do all the tie downs at the end and you can just use those grommeted holes or what have you for your case to route things and manage them cleanly 
after the USB 2 header is plugged in, it's time to connect the audio header. That is for the 3.5 millimeter jacks in the front. If present, that would be HD audio. That's normally in the bottom left of the board when oriented in a standard rotation standing up in a normal case. Finally, USB 3.0, that's of course present on basically everything now. If you have AM3 Plus boards, a lot of those don't have it still, but you plug in the USB 3 header into a special, I think it's a 20 pin socket that's almost always located basically adjacent to the 24 pin power header. You want to do this before you connect your video card generally. And that, be very careful with it because those pins will bend and it's just like a CPU socket where it's a nightmare to unbend them. So plug that in, line up the notch with the gap in the socket plastic shroud and make sure that lines up and you'll be good to go. So that covers all of the front panel headers for the standard case, covers the power headers for the motherboard and all that's left for us is the GPU power. So once you've mounted your GPU, and I normally do this last personally, you mount the GPU or the video card, and then you connect your six and eight pin power headers from the power supply into that as appropriate. Try and route and manage them before you connect them and you'll be good to go. There's one last main set of cables to plug in and that's for the storage devices. So whether you've got an SSD or a 3.5 inch hard drive, they use the same type of headers. The only time it's different is if you've got an M.2 device that connects to the board. And in that case, it's still pretty darn simple. You just connect the SSD M.2 form factor directly into the socket. You screw it down, no cables involved whatsoever. The board will power that device. For an SSD like we're using, a 2.5 inch sort of standard SSD, or if you have a hard drive, you need a SATA cable. Those come with the motherboard plug in the SATA cable, line up the L brackets with the receiving end on each side, try and manage it before you connect it, and then line up the L bracket for, of course, the SATA power, which is that sort of thin L-shaped cable. It's not at all like the other power option for fans, which would be the four pin Molex. So you plug the SATA power, SATA data in, and then that takes care of the drive. You've taken care of the board, the GPU, the fans, and the front panel headers with USB 2, USB 3, and HD audio all connected as well. I don't think I'm missing anything. There's not much else in 99% of builds, but if you've got special hubs or controllers or lights, then check the instructions and apply cables as necessary. So that's it. That's all you have to do to build the system. Pretty easy at the end of the day. Once you get good, it only takes a few minutes to do, even though that first run through might be a couple hours worst case scenario. For troubleshooting steps, if you run into issues with booting, search our channel for troubleshooting. You'll find a guide where we talk about things to do. We've got articles on the website, of course, as well for troubleshooting system boot problems. And then your next steps would be installing Windows, Linux, or some other OS and installing your core applications. I use Ninite for installing sort of bulk applications like LibreOffice Libre or OpenOffice or Chrome or whatever, you can use one program to do that or do it manually. And then once you're done with that, that's it. You can use your system as normally. You will want to look at BIOS or UEFI before getting too deep into things and installing your OS though. Make sure it's set up to either AHCI or NVMe or whatever's appropriate for your build. And if you have questions about that, you can check our forums, gamersnexus.net. Go to the forums and we'll help you out with PC part selection, troubleshooting, and any other issues you run across. But as always, a link in the description below for the full article if any of this went by too quickly. And hit that Patreon link in the post for video if you want to help us out directly. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.